this morning what I want to want to do is I want to start by kind of telling you a little bit about um, my experience about you know coming into relationship with God. And there's, so I got a little story behind this that it's kind of introduced what I want to talk about this morning. So I'm one of those people that that you know my experience of coming to Jesus and accepting Jesus as my Savior was something very very uh, powerful and meaning to me. It, it, it really changed my life and really there's a lot of just tons of emotion involved in it because it was a, just such a powerful experience for me and this 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 transformation started probably in like an, i can't remember exactly but i think it was like an october november time frame so i became a christian and it was like i said it was a very powerful experience and it was also a very powerful experience of that that you know discovering god and reading the bible and just just getting more and more excited about my faith and say this stuff is great right and of course because of that time of year it's also the time of year you know around november december where if, you, if you're going to church people will start ta- singing christmas carols and i'd heard christmas carols before i didn't grow up in a church but of course in our culture you you know around christmas times you hear christmas carols and i've always i always enjoyed them i always thought they were very, they were they were very pleasant to listen to and to sing but let me tell you as a new believer as a new believer who was really experiencing God in a really powerful and passionate way, to sing those Christmas carols all of a sudden took on an incredible power. They just hit me really, really emotionally. I, I was singing in church and I'm just almost in tears because the words, I challenge you, listen to the words in some of those Christmas carols. They're significant and they're powerful and there's just so much strong emotion behind them. So, I started going to church as a new believer, loving the Christmas carols, but frankly, in many of the churches around that time where I was going to church, the people who were singing these Christmas carols in the pew, they were kind of like, joy to the world. (laughs) And I'm not kidding. There was frustration and anger that came up in me, and I almost wanted to yell at the top of my lungs, would you people please wake up? Please. Please. Do you, aren't you not hearing the power in these words? We're talking about, this is incredible stuff. How can you be so blasé about it? I confess my attitude was wrong. As a new believer, that can happen, right? You, you, you come in, you're all excited, and, you're, and, and you run into these passive people or passive believers, and you can get all judgmental. So I confess I was, I was judgmental. But at the same time, I think it illustrates something that was wrong there. You know, there, there, there's, there's something wrong when, when we get all blasé about the, really some of the most powerful words about Christ that have ever been written. And we can just get all nonchalant about it and have no passion. And it's not something to guilt us in, but it should also point out that why? Why, why is there so, such a lack of passion in, in, in something that is so powerful and so meaningful? So I guess that's what I want to talk about today is 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 passion for our life in Christ. Uh, you know, I ca- we, somehow we've got to get this passion. We've got we to stop going through the motions and be excited about our, our, our faith in Christ again. I think it's a really important thing. So I want to start by reading two passages, which I've kind of chosen as my, my, my cornerstone for the, for the talk this morning. This is from Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. These verses point out to us, or they're, they're stressing that the kingdom of God is like a great treasure of so much value that when you discover it, everything else just kind of dims in comparison. Everything else just isn't as exciting anymore once you've experienced coming into a a relationship with God. And not to say that all these things are bad, but in comparison, they're just not even close in value of coming into, of experiencing the kingdom of God and recognizing the value there. So everything else just seems kind of cheap in comparison in our experience. 
But the truth is, is oftentimes, I got to say in my life, you know, I, I shared with all of you before that I'm kind of a person that's a little bit of a downer. It's easy for me to get really negative down emotions. So I got to admit, every day I'm not walking around with tons of excitement and enthusiasm. There's times even when I come into church on Sunday and there's just not a lot of enthusiasm there. But that's a problem. You know, that's, that's not the person I want to be. I want to have passion. I want to have passion for my, for my faith. I want to have passion for, for my life in Christ. I don't want to just be going through the emotions. I just don't want to, you know, coast along. I want to be excited and I want to have passion. I want to be serious and sold out for this. When people look at me, I want them to look at a person and say, there's a man who, who is sold out for Christ. And, and I'm just challenging all of us. Is that the person you want to be? Do you just want to go through the emotions or do you want to have true life and passion in your faith? And that's kind of what, that's what I want to talk about this morning. Is, you know, I have th- kind of three questions I want to talk about. Why do we lose the passion? Sometimes we start with the passion and then it can kind of wane over time. How can we get it back? And then the other question I'm asking myself is, is the passion something we should truly be chasing after? Um, the reason why I'm asking that question is it's something we should be chasing after is when I first became a Christian, I, I served in a, I started worshiping in a church as the Open Brethren, which is a church I really appreciated and loved. But at that time, there was a lot of debate and discussion going on in that church about, you know, do we preach to the emotions or do we preach to the mind? That was a constant debate, in, 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 especially in those who, who, who taught or preached, is which one do you focus on, the mind or the emotions? And I get it. I get why there was a concern. Because sometimes, in some churches, we tend to, it becomes all about chasing the emotion, you know? I just want to feel excited. I just want to feel good, right? And if, and if your faith becomes all about chasing that emotion, that could lead to a lot of problems, and that could lead to a lot of damage in your faith. It can't just be about emotion. There's got to be some substance there. There's got to be something of true substance. But at the same time, the question I ask myself, if I have really come into a relationship with Christ, with God, and I truly experience all that all the wonderful and fantastic things that he has for me, when I have met the creator of the universe in a real and powerful and personal way, how can that not affect my emotions? How could it not? So I th- the truth is, is I think we need to appeal to both. There's nothing wrong. In fact, it's a good thing to be excited about our faith. It's something we should be seeking after. In fact, Philippians 4.4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say, Rejoice. So that's worded almost as a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. It's something we need to be doing to be rejoicing in our relationship. If we're not experiencing that, that rejoicing again, then we seem to start trying to figure out what's going on and how do we get there again? How do we, how do we you know, stir up that passion in us so that we mean it? You know, one of the reasons why I think we, we kind of, that, that passion can kind of wane after time or it starts to get low in us <coughs> is I think we get confused about what's really important. We get distracted on things that are of less significance and we start ignoring the things that are truly, truly important in life. You know, there was a movie many years ago, I'm showing my age here, but maybe you recognize it, which is the Dead Poet Society. It's a very meaningful movie. I, I, I recommend it. Um, And it was with Robin Williams. But there was one point in that movie where it got very serious. And Robin Williams was talking to one of his students. And and, and he got very serious and he was telling him this. He he, he started talking about the the things that sustain life versus the things that life is all about. And this is the quote I found in the movie. Robin Williams said this. Medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. I think there's something very powerful and meaningful there. I want to take it a little bit farther than than that. But again, it's just pointing out that idea 
that we have to ask ourselves all the time, what are we getting distracted with? And the things that we spend so much of our time and energy on, are they the things that really matter? You know, Robin Williams left it, or this, the movie left it at this point where they're talking about poetry and beauty, and those are all fantastic things. But I would, cha- I would even take that farther and point this out, that in Philippians 1.21, Paul said this, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. That's the thing that really matters. That's the stuff that's really significant. That's supposed to be the foundation. That's what life is about. For me to live is Christ. You know, all those things, poetry, beauty, romance, love, wonderful things, but I think they're more, they're more a result of, put, of, of putting first things first. I think they're more the result of when Christ is the center of our life, we start to appreciate and experience those things at a greater depth. So those aren't what it's about, but they're the side effect of that we are focusing on what's important. We've put Christ at the center. You know, Christ at the center is the pl- only place he truly belongs. And when we put him at the center, we begin to experience life in the way that he intended us to experience it. So all I'm saying here, I'm not trying to guilt anyone, but I am telling you, let's put first things first. And if we put first things first, it starts to put other things in proper context. And maybe we can start to experience that passion again for Christ. One of the other reasons why I think we start to lose the excitement, we start to lose the passion for our faith, is we start to forget or our God gets too small. God just kind of starts to close in and becomes very ins- less significant to us. We lose sight of who he truly is. You know, one reason why this kind of happens for me, and I'm, I'm not looking to be offensive, but, you know, when I first became a Christian, I started going sometimes to t- more traditional churches. And what kind of happens sometimes is, 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 is our faith and our truth gets wrapped in a lot of ritual and a lot of repetition, and, and a lot of just going through, the emo- going through the motions. And I think what that can do is that can almost lead a lot of people to the conclusion that God is boring, that faith is boring, it's uninteresting. And I think it's sad when that happens, because there, what could be more exciting than, the, than getting into relationship and knowing the God of the universe? You know, one thing that I do to help myself, to remind myself that God is not boring, that he's something exciting, or someone exciting, I should say, is, you know, I think about what's the thing that really excites me in life? What is the stuff in life that I'm really passionate about, that if I got a chance to do that, I get excited? And the thing that probably excites me the most is nature. I just love getting out in nature. I love getting out and seeing beautiful scenery. The beauty of nature just, it just lifts my heart. And that's the stuff I really get excited. Maybe some, for you, it's something else that you're very passionate about that really gets you excited. But, think, but, I, but I, I always challenge myself to think of this. When I'm enjoying those things, those things came from the imagination of God. There was a creator of nature. That was in his imagination. So all the things that I enjoy so completely came from his imagination. There's nothing you can enjoy on this earth that you can be excited about in this earth that did not come from Christ, that did not come from the mind of God. For me, nature is, nature is something that does that for me. I love nature and its beauty, but more than that, I am absolutely awestruck when I understand I can fully enjoy the person from whose imagination this beauty came from. I'm rem- when I look at nature, I'm reminded of its source. And that excites me because if nature is beauty, how much more beautiful is the creator of that nature? You know, the other thing is that sometimes I think, you know, we, we get bored with God or he becomes smaller for us is because we start to think he's predictable, right? We got it all, fi- he's predictable, right? We, same thing all the time, right? But you know what? I want to challenge you. Go read the Gospels. Go read the Gospels and look at the disciples when they were walking with Jesus. They were on edge all the time. He surprised them every single day. He went in a direction they weren't expecting. Right? God is a God of surprises. He will surprise you. You know, the disciples, 
you know, for, for instance, look at, think of the disciples when they, when they went to Jesus. He, Jesus was preaching on a mountainside, and there was like 5,000 people that came to watch him preach. And the disciples got concerned because these people are hungry. So they were being responsible leaders, and they went to Jesus and said, you should send them away because they're hungry. And Jesus looked at them and said, why don't you feed them? Do you think they expected that answer? I don't think they expected that answer. I wish I could see it in a film because I think their, their jaw dropped. And they're going, huh? But just I'm just pointing that out, that, that, that you know, God is a God of surprises. He, su- he, he, he surprised the disciples all the time. He was ne- almost never the person they expected him to be. So let's be surprised again by who God is. I just want to do one more little exercise with you here. Again, to try and, try and ex- expand our understanding about who God is and what we have in him. So I'm just going to ask you, invite you to please close your eyes for a minute. Just close your eyes. Forget everybody else is here. And I'm going to challenge you to use your imagination. And what I want you to do, I don't know what it is, but what is that one thing that you can, that you can imagine that would just excites you? What's your best thing? What's the thing that is just the most amazing for you? Maybe it's a trip to Hawaii. Maybe it's, you know, going to craft. I don't know. But what is that? Think of what, what's that thing that would just be awesome, the best thing ever. Put that in your imagination. Put that, focus on that. And as you're doing that, let me read these words to you. This is from 1 Corinthians 2.9. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. No human mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. You can open your eyes. I hope that that, that hits you some, at some level, right? That, you know, you can stretch out your imagination as much as possible to think of the best thing, and it's still not an accurate representative representation of the good things that God has in plan for you. You know, the Bible says that Jesus suffered the, cr- the cross and scorned its shame for the joy set before him. So there's no reason why we cannot be excited lo- looking forward to the joy that's set before us. Other thing is, I think why God gets small is sometimes I think we got them all figured out. You know, if, if, especially if you're somebody who's been in the church for 20 or 30 years and you go to Bible study once or twice a week, you know, you've, you've done a lot of studying, a lot of thinking, right? And sometimes what happens is, is we just get familiar. And we think, we got God all figured out. I'm educated, right? And I'm just going to challenge you, think again. You haven't got him figured out. <laughs> God is so immense, so large, so complicated, so amazingly other that you could spend an eternity getting to know him and you still won't exhaust it. If you think you got him figured out, your God is too small. He really is not that small that you can fit him in your, your limited understanding. And why should that excite us? Because what a mystery. You know, I love mysteries. I love it. He, he, we already determined that he's something amazing and wonderful and good and, he, and you can't exhaust the depth of his, wonder, of his wonder. You can't exhaust it. You can spend forever trying to get to know him and you'll never run out. That's something we should be excited about. The other thing is, is I think we have to realize that God's not under control. God isn't safe. I love the way, C, that's what C.S. Lewis said. I love the way he said it. God is not tame. You know, who wants a tame God? Who wants a God that we've got under control? Not me. And don't ever, we've we got to stop thinking that we've got him under control. He's not under control. He's out here doing amazing things in the world. He wants to do amazing things. But he's the one in control, not us. And we have to recognize that he's not tame and let him be the God he is rather than the God that we feel we can control. You know, I'm going to say something this morning I think might be a little bit radical, right? Because you know, if we look at the world today, I think there's one huge fear that many, many people communicate. There's something that this world is very afraid of. And it's this, it says, we're afraid of, of religious extremists. Stay away from religious extremists. I'm going to challenge all of us this morning, myself included, be a Christian extremist. Be a Jesus extremist. And what do I mean by that? 
right? When it comes to love, compassion, charity, justice, be extreme. Be extreme in the things that Jesus has called us to be and do. Be extreme about that. Don't hold back. Christ has asked us to, pour, to go all in. Be extreme about the good things that God has called us to and the good things he wants us to be. To give you some examples of some Christians who have, who have taken this to heart, who have be become extreme about their faith and the way that they live and their, their, re their reverence to Christ. I'm just going to give you an example of three in history that had a huge impact on the world around them because they took their faith and they went all out with it. One of them I'm sure you're familiar with is Mother Teresa. That wasn't too long ago. You can go home and read about the things that she's done. In Hindu society, there, there, there's a caste system. And, and when you're born, you're, you're kind of born into one of these castes. It's like a hierarchy of significance in their society. And if, way at the bottom, there's, there's a group called the untouchables, which are the lowest of the low. And Mother Teresa became famous because she chose to serve the lowest of the low. She chose to care for them when nobody else wanted to. And she dedicated her life to caring and meeting the needs of those who were in desperate need. She was an extremist. In 1971, she won the Nobel Prize because it was recognized how far she went in caring for those who needed to be cared for. Another Christian extremist, maybe not as famous, is George Mueller. <clears throat> George Mueller was a man who lived during the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain. And what happened in the Industrial Revolution, it was very, very tough times. And so people tended to die very young. And oftentimes they died young while they still had kids. That resulted in, a, in an explosion of orphans in, in Great Britain. And so what some people thought would be a good idea is let's take these orphans and put them in workhouses. Let's make them do something useful to earn their keep. So it was a horrible time of life. Well, George Mueller, you know, looked at this and said, that's not right. He said, somebody's got to do something about this. And so he did something about it. He got on his knees and he prayed. And when he prayed, he acted. And over his lifetime, he cared for over 10,024 orphans during his lifetime. He established 117 schools which offered Christian education to more than 120,000 children. And he did that, he never asked, he never went out raising money. He, he believed very strongly in the power of pray and so, prayer, so he prayed. Never asked anybody for money. Accomplished all that because he prayed. In fact, to the day he died, he kept a journal where every time somebody gave him money to participate in his ministry, he would write it down with every intention of paying it back. So he was not looking to man to supply the needs. He was looking to God. And what an amazing thing was accomplished. Because he was an extremist, he went all out. Another one which, which is a very important person in history, you, you might have seen a movie a few years ago called Amazing Grace. If you haven't seen it, go home and look for it. It's a very good movie. And it, in that movie, it's a lot about William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce lived in the 1800s, and he was, he was a British politician. He, in, in the British Parliament, he, while he was a politician, he became a Christian. And he got excited about his faith, and he said, I'm excited about my faith, and it's got to make a different in the, difference in my world. And he looked around, and he saw slavery. And he said, slavery just doesn't fit with what I know about Jesus. Somebody's got to do something about this. So he began fighting. He got a bunch of people around him, and he began fighting it. In fact, the people around him were so fervent in their faith that, that, that the British Parliament referred to them as the saints. Probably a little bit of derisive. They, they called him and his followers the saints. But, you know, he fought for 44 years to, a, to end African slavery in the British Empire. Which, and, he, and after 44 years, they succeeded. And that's important because by stopping in the British Empire, because they were the main slave traders, eventually that spread all over the world and ended African slavery. That's a Christian extremist. So you see, it's not so much extremism that's the problem. It's what you're extreme about that's the problem. If you're extreme about hate, if you're extreme about, about destroying 
That's one thing. But if you're extreme about love and about service and about compassion, that's a good thing. Get extreme about the things that God calls you to be extreme about. You can just put up the picture on the screen. That's me. That's me surfing in Hawaii. I just wanted to, just wanted to show off a little bit, so I put it in there. <laughs> Actually, I do, I do got a reason why I'm showing you that, that, past, that picture. But you got to admit, it looks kind of cool, right? I mean, um, so why I got this picture on there is, is, is I, I want to challenge all of us to catch the wave. What do I mean by that, catch the wave? You know, I've been a Christian for, I can't even count it, 20, somewhere between 20 and 30 years. And <clears throat> so I've been in the church for a long time. And what you see happening in the church a lot is there's, there's trends and movements that come along, things come along. Does anyone remember the prayer of Jabez? That was a big thing for a little while. It was like a trend that people got excited about. It goes for a while, nice, exciting, and then it kind of starts to go off. So we're not talking about it that much anymore. And what happens, I think, is if you've been in the church for any length of time and you've experienced a few of these trends, is you kind of go, you know what? I got excited about the last trend and it got nice, it was exciting for a while, then it went away. You know, so we go, I'm not going to go through that again. So when we see something coming, we kind of cross our arms and we go, yeah, I'm going to wait and see how this works out. Right? Because we don't want to invest ourselves in case we get disappointed. And I just want to challenge us, don't do that. Don't do that. When you see God starting to do something new, don't just cross your arms and say, well, I'm going to wait and see what happens. You're robbing yourself of an incredible joy. You can be robbing yourself of an incredible joy. You know, when I was being taught, my instructor's in the, back in the picture there, and if you, if you kind of sit there and wait for the wave to come, you're just going to be sitting on that board forever, up and down, just rocking in the waves, right? My instructor stressed to us is that you've got to be looking, you got to be looking out where the waves are coming from. And you've got to be watching for that energy growing. And when you see that wave coming, you've got to start paddling. You've got to start paddling with all your worth because you've got to get momentum going so that when that wave comes, you catch it. You catch it at the right time and you ride it, Right? Now, when you ride a wave, you might get to ride it for 50, you know, 50 feet or something like that. But what a joy. What a joy. I would rather ride that wave for 50 feet than not ride it at all. And I think it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. I would rather experience the new things God's doing for a time than not to experience it all. And I think we have to be the same way. Like, let's not get all laid back in our faith. You know, I, I, I've been in the church long enough to know that that's just the way God works. He sends these, these waves of blessing for a while, and then they, then, they, then they slack off. And then there's a new one. He's a God of new things. He's always doing something new. So let's not get all discouraged because the old thing's ending. Let's look to what the new thing that is coming. And let's get excited about that and start paddling like crazy so we can catch it when God's doing something new. You know, the other reason why I think we get all discouraged, or I should say I get kind of discouraged in my faith, or, or, or my excitement starts to lack, is I think sometimes it just all gets so complicated. When I look at my faith and my life and my Christian service, it just gets so complicated sometimes. Sometimes I look at my life and all I see is this long list of, of more obligations. Does anybody feel that way? Do you ever feel in your life that it's just a, an endless list of obligations coming out of you? More things you have to do. I know I'm that way. Sometimes, especially even in Christian leadership, to be honest, sometimes it just feels like a long list of obligations. But you know, whenever I feel that way, I got to challenge myself and say, what, what, more, what is more important that I could be investing myself in? You know? If I, if I make sure I'm investing in the things that are truly significant, then, then even if it's work, I'm there. I want my life to count. I want to invest myself in the stuff that matters. And I think ultimately that's where the joy is. Is when we're investing ourselves in what matters and the true things that count, there's real joy in that. 
You know, a while ago, I'm not wanna, hopefully I don't ruin the movie for any of you, but we went to see, I went to see the movie I Can Only Imagine. It was in the theaters a little while ago. Don't want to ruin it, but I have to ruin it a little bit. <coughs> and the story is about a young guy who grows up in a house that is basically a horrible house, where his father is, a, is kind of a monster, as you put it. And, you know, he's beaten and he's, and he's discouraged and he's, and he's knocked down. And he's growing up in that house, but, th but the, uh, something happened, especially towards the end of the movie, that frankly, just, it, it just wrecked me. My emotions, which was, you know, I had to cover my head and cry almost because it was just so powerful. But I think most people would, would relate to the son who, who had to forgive his father. But I really related to the father who had lived, who had lived a broken life all of his life. And then he came to understand that he was forgiven in Jesus. You know, it reminded me again, you know, we want to see miracles happen. We would be excited if we could see mirac miracles happening all around us. You know what? That man experienced a miracle. He experienced a miracle because he experienced forgiveness in Christ. That man experienced a mi miracle because he was changed. It was almost funny the way it was in the movie because he didn't fully understand what was happening to him, but his heart was changing. He was changing even when he's on his deathbed, his, his outlook on life and everything was changing inside of him, right? That's a miracle because who else can do that? Who else can take a broken person and a broken life and bring it back to life to give healing where it's so desperately needed? Who else can do that? That's a miracle. And we need to remind ourselves that those miracles are still happening all the time. Let's get excited about that. We serve a God who can fix broken things, who can fix broken people. I'm one who experienced that in my life. I experienced that power of healing, and I just don't think it can come from any, anywhere else. That's something to be excited about. You know, Nehemiah 8.10 says this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, we have to recognize that when we are joyful, we are powerful. It's, the, it's when we have joy that we have the greatest strength to serve. I know it's tough. How do you get joy? I'm not sure I've provided all the answers, but boy, let's seek that joy that gives us power to serve. You know, yes, life is, seems like a whole bunch of, of obligations, but you know what? I, I have seen, I have seen in my life where a, a group of, a small group of people in a, in a small group, we got a vision to serve our community. We just wanted to do a, a car wash, just to serve our community. And rather than that being, oh, one more burden, we were so excited about it, it turned out to be fun. We loved it. We were full of joy. And in that joy, people saw it and wanted to come get their car washed, right? So there's real, when, when, we, can, when we can experience that joy together, that's when s service can become powerful. So I'm just going to challenge all of us. You know, you were saved for service. God wants you to serve, but that doesn't have to be a, a, an endless string of, of, of obligations. Like, oh, you know, if we get excited together, if we get this vision together and we serve together, we all get in it together, we can experience joy that I think will be powerful and will start changing the city and the place around us. Let's, let's get extreme about, about serving together and making a difference in the world around us. Not only because, not only because we need, the service is needed, but because in that we can experience joy. So let's serve out of the overflow of the joy that, that God is putting inside of us. You know, Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Let's all pray that God would remove our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, that he would put a new sensitivity in us where we can be sensitive to the things he's doing, that we can get renewed excitement about what he's doing in our life and doing in the world around us. Let's, let's pray that he, do, he does that miracle in us of giving us a heart of flesh that is more sensitive to him than all the struggles in the world around us. We need to focus more on recognizing the things we already have in Christ than chasing after more things. 
He has already given us so much. You know, if Jesus chose not to do one more thing for you, he's already done enough. God already gave his best and his greatest for you on the cross. He saved you. He's given you new life. He's given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gave his best. But it's not stopped there. He still chooses and wants to bless you every single day. We have reason to rejoice. We have reason to rejoice. No matter how bad life is, I know I feel it, I'm a downer, but I challenge myself. No matter how bad things get, when I put it in perspective, I always have more reason to rejoice than to despair. I always have more reason because of what Christ has already accomplished. So I think we need to pray that we can really begin to experience that in a, in a deep way. God, give me a heart of flesh and take from me this heart of stone. In closing, I just want to express this. My last thought. I want to know Christ. I want to know him. In Philippians 3, 7, and 8, it's a very powerful passage here that I think summarizes what, what I was hoping to communicate today. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. I consider them garbage that I may, cons- may gain Christ. Christ is the, is, is the one of ultimate value. In him, we can have passion and joy. If you read those words, I just want to point out, those are not measured words. Those are not measured words. Those are words of passion and commitment. Those are words of, 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 of extremism. So my challenge to me, to all of us today, is go and be excited about Christ and serve him with passion.